very excited to have you all here. I'm really looking forward to this session. It's been something that we've been planning for some time now. Uh, so let us begin. Let's go on the top of the hour. I know people will keep coming into this session. So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which I'm seated. I'm here on the land of Gabi Gabi and uh, with the Jinnabara to the to the uh, to the east, and I'd uh, like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, so my name's Morag, and I run the Permaculture Education Institute. And the Permaculture Education Institute is essentially an organisation that globally works to support and, and teach permaculture teachers around the world to help myceliate this one planet living and local food systems that we know are really essential in order to 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 help to shape the kind of future that we, we know that we need. Um, I grew up actually in the city. I live now in an eco village, uh, Crystal Waters eco village, but I grew up in, in the suburbs of Melbourne and I grew up with, with gardens and chooks and my family introduced me when I was just a, a little tacker to, to permaculture. And so it's been something that's been with me my whole entire life and also growing food in the city. Um, I went on to study landscape architecture, and but then just entirely focused my attention when I graduated because I was sort of a little bit disillusioned. I have to say at the end of that, didn't really get to touch plants or design community spaces. So I went on to focus um, my work on creating um, citizen design projects that were in our common spaces um, with community, by community and for community. And it was back in the 1990s, actually, that I first met Gav, who's one of our um, presenters today. Gav and I uh, worked together to uh, get North Street City Farm happening in Brisbane and also co-founded the Australian City Farms and Community Gardens Network, which is now called the um, Community Gardens Australia, which Gav heads up. Uh, so this session today, the Urban Agriculture um, Masterclass, is uh, part of uh, the Urban Agriculture Month. Now, Urban Agriculture Month is uh, an initiative of Sustain Australia. And so we have here today also Nick Rose, who is the founder and director of Sustain and the creator of this Urban Agriculture Month. So we're a little bit early, I know, but, you know, urban agriculture is worth celebrating and jumping in early to do that. So all of, all of November we'll be hosting a whole lot of different sessions as well. So this is the very first and I'm delighted to have everyone here. Uh, we will also be hosting another masterclass at the end of November, so topping and tailing with a session to really dive deeply into urban permaculture, um, urban agriculture and urban permaculture. Um, and then in the middle of the month, we'll be hosting a, a film club, which is where we'll be screening uh, permaculture, urban agriculture films that really focus in on what, what we can do in the cities and the suburbs, uh, and also hopefully <coughs> bringing together a, um, a panel with that too. Uh, also too, we will be uh, dropping, uh, every week we're dropping a new podcast episode and I've been busy recording those over the last couple of weeks. So we'll be talking about um, backyard beekeeping, um, urban mushroom farming, um, city farming, Faulkner food bowls, and also... Um, Oh, that was one more. Gosh, I'll remember it as soon as I, I move on. Anyway, so it's it's an absolute delight to welcome you today. Um, there was well over 500, well, almost 500 people who registered for this session. So that's a great indication of an interest in urban agriculture. Um, and also, I wanted to thank those of you who were able to, to give something when you registered. We've also been able to um, raise a, a gift of $800, which we're going to send 100% across to refugee permaculture education projects. So that's really exciting. And I wanted to say thank you very much to everyone. Uh, so uh, just in terms of what's going to happen in this session, uh, shortly we'll be introducing our panel and each panelist will have somewhere between 10 to 12 minutes-ish, um, you know, maybe 15, but roughly around that much to share what they're doing because each and every one of them are, are Churchill Fellows who are deeply involved in urban agriculture in one form or other. Uh, so we have Nick Rose, who's 
whose focus has been on food sovereignty and also urban and community food systems. Gavin Hardy, who I've mentioned already, who's actually Zooming in to us from um, Italy, where he is currently on his Churchill Fellowship. He's been away for three months or so already and coming home in about a week. Um, and Fiona Buning, who had just returned, she's told me, on the 2nd of October from her Churchill Fellowship uh, for three months. She went to the, to the U.S., uh, UK, Netherlands, and there was one other place you did tell me, Fiona, I'm sorry. And so Fiona is going to be sharing with us a lot around her perspectives on urban farming. She runs the um, a, a micro farm, a small urban farm, a micro green farm uh, called Ainsley Urban Farm. And uh, I will introduce each panelist as they come more in depth, but that's who we have in our room today. And it's going to be such a rich conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Firstly, though, I just did want to mention if you'd like to chat and ask questions along the way, please do. There's the chat function down below. Um, all of the panellists have agreed to, you know, if they see a question, to be answering while, while we're going, as long as they're not, you know, focused on speaking. But also feel free to, all of you, to be sharing what you're doing in urban agriculture um, and also share your experience, your links. This is a networking event. It's a possibility for us to explore and expand our, our collective understanding. I mean, really... This notion of urban agriculture is so important and, you know, actually connecting together urban agriculture projects is even more important to build the strength of the movement. Um, so uh, one more thing before we start the panel discussion, I just did want to ask if you're not actually speaking, um, would you mind muting? I'm just fine. Sometimes I can hear some background noise and just to make sure that we don't get feedback, but just to keep that in mind. All right. Um, do we have Nick in the room? Nick Rose. Is, is Nick here yet? Just want to check whether he's been able to drop in. Not yet. Okay. All right. He might be held up. So what we might do then, Gav, is how about we go first to you? Would that be all right? Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay. So I just wanted to give a little bit more of an introduction to Gav. So like I said before, Gav's still in Italy on his Churchill Fellowship, um, exploring community food forests and orchards. Um, and for 25 years, he's been creating, teaching and writing in areas of permaculture, environmental design, ecological sustainability, and particularly in subtropical Australia. He's based up here in Brisbane and has created an eco-flat Brisbane, which is a fabulous example of subtropical permaculture in his family home. Uh, He's uh, a co-founder and regular contributor to North East Street City Farm. And as I said, that's where we met and started working together when it was just a big open paddock. Mm -hmm. And um, he's also the Queensland coordinator of Community Gardens Australia. So thank you for joining us, Gav. And I'm so excited to hear news from, from Italy, where you are right now, but yeah. also of your various places where you've been traveling. Um, just let me know when you want me to share your screen or maybe there's something else you'd like to jump in and say first. Yeah, well, first of all, I'll say buongiorno to everyone. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in Italy, as, uh, as Morag said. I'm actually in the Apennine Mountains um, between Bologna and, and Florence. Um, my, my, my research officially finished about a week ago. But I've just actually, you know, when you, when you do this sort of work, you, you keep coming across more and more projects and things that are going on. And I've just discovered that in this region of, of Italy, uh, there were um, chestnut groves um, through the mountains. And the chestnut here is called the bread tree, or was called the bread tree, because that's where folks back in the days made their bread they made their bread from chestnut flour um, and and since industrial agriculture there's been a total shift to um, using wheat as the base for making bread um, but it's been interesting I've been walking around uh, uh, the area and come across these really old groves of chestnuts so there's another project I can get into and um, do a bit of research on 
anyway, that's a, that's a little bit of an aside. Um, perhaps more, I guess we put up the first slide. And letting you know, I'm actually uh, coming to you from a smartphone. Um, I'm traveling, I've been on the road for three and a half months and I've been traveling technology light using a smartphone for everything that I'm doing. And uh, it's quite amazing what you can actually do. So I'll put this little presentation together using my using my Android smartphone. So, so who am I? I'm Gavin Hardy. Uh, I run a little uh, permaculture consultancy practice called hardypermaculture.com. Um, please go and have a look at that. Uh, you can click on my uh, social media links, YouTube, that sort of thing. Uh, I think I've got 25 videos up at the moment uh, on YouTube, mainly looking at agroforestry. I'm also the, the Queensland coordinator of the National Community Gardens Network, Community Gardens Australia. Um, so go and have a look at uh, uh, communitygarden.org.au to find out more. Community Gardens Australia is sort of like the, the peak body representing community gardens right across the country. And we think there's probably two to 3,000 community gardens uh, currently in Australia. It's very hard to get a number on that, but that's sort of the feeling. So urban agriculture, um, what do we think, what do I think that is? Um, well, firstly, two words, urban and agriculture. So urban to me is not just about the city, um, it's about towns as well um, and villages. Um, and growing food within close proximity to where people live. Um, since industrial agriculture, but it's been quite uh, an unusual situation where we can actually grow food a long way from where people live. That that's unprecedented in in world history. Throughout most of our time, we've grown food very close to where we live. And agriculture, what's agriculture? Well, you know, some people think agriculture is like industrial agriculture, but agriculture is really just growing food. It's growing food anywhere. That's um, in any way, shape or form. So uh, it's, it's more than just uh, market gardens and, and um, other ways of growing food. I'm just having a look at a bloke who's just setting up a, a lawnmower. I might have to move in a minute. Um, and so, yeah, I, I see urban agriculture in a, in a very wide context. Um, I see it as um, way beyond the, the normal definition, I guess, of what um, urban and what agriculture might, might mean to a lot of people. Within urban agriculture, and this is, the, this is sort of my speciality, is the community food system. So the community food system, what's that? Um, so it's usually, usually uh, community, community food systems or projects take place on publicly accessible land, um, but not always. They, they usually run by not-for-profit groups, so associations or trusts or foundations, but not always. Um, they, they almost always have an educational aim uh, in the community, in that community food space. And they usually have volunteer involvement, but not always. So what are we talking about? We're talking about community gardens. We're talking about community supported agriculture, where people might um, subscribe to a, a local farmer and, and buy produce direct from that farmer. We're also talking about verge gardens and the popularity of verge gardens across the world is really, really, really increasing. And we're talking about uh, public orchards and agroforestry, and that's that's really the the aim of my my research at the moment, is looking at those those systems. And the way I got into this was to start thinking about different ways of doing community gardening. So, you know, community gardening uh, in Australia and many parts of the world is mainly dom dominated by allotment allotment style gardening um, where people will rent a plot and uh, and do their vegetable garden uh, or herb gardening or flower gardening in the plot. <clears throat> but 
but I wanted to look at some different ways of doing it. So I started looking at um, community orchards, and I noticed some community orchards in Australia already. Uh, and I also wanted to look at community food forests. And I also wanted to look at the integration of these sorts of very novel ways of growing food with the existing institutions and facilities um, that uh, that are just uh, you know in the, in the everyday space where we live. Um, so if you look at some of these these images I put up here, and these are my images for my travels for the last three months. So amazing project in in Miami in Florida, which is the Food Forests for Schools project. Um, uh, currently, they have 21 food forests within elementary schools within the city of Florida. They're aiming to get, get that up to 51 food forests. And they teach the kids their, their, their um, science and maths within the food forest. And they also get a lot of really, really high um, yields of, of food that the kids can take home. Um, that photo at the top of the middle of the, of the photo of the uh, slide, that's in Rotterdam in, in Holland. Um, a food forest in a really high density living situation. I've met lots of great people on this trip, um, people from really diverse ethnic backgrounds. That's one of the great things about these sorts of systems that I, that I like. Um, is that we can learn from everybody, uh, different cultures, different backgrounds, different food um, knowledge, different plant knowledge. Uh, at the bottom left of the screen, a, an orchard integrated into a car park in Seattle in the USA. Uh, I love um, the way that that's happened. And, and those trees have been netted uh, really expensive netting to keep um, pets, pets out. I think they're, they're apple trees in that photo. Um, harvesting fruit trees from people's backyard. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and there's a bit of people very close, so I hope you can still hear me. If you can't, let me know. And then uh, community activities in food forests um, uh, in, and in orchards. So this is a, the, the last photo there is just um, some uh, people in London harvesting fruit trees. I'm really interested in that sort of experience uh, there. So if we move on to the next slide, all right. Great. I realise I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very cognizant of the, of the time that I've got here. So I guess the, the key key thrust of my research um, overseas, uh, doing this Churchill Fellowship. Um, looking at a few different things. So I'm looking at it's the governance, the, the decision-making uh, models around these sorts of systems, um, food forests and orchards. Uh, is it consensus decision-making, the decision by consent, is it more of a hierarchical model? I'm, I'm really looking at fundraising, how these groups organise and, and raise funds. And related to that is how they partner and collaborate with different groups. And that's been one of my key learnings is the really successful projects um, partner with other organisations, either financial partnerships or in site partnerships. So the people who own the land, um, those sorts of things coming together and there's some amazing projects out there, you know, people who are harvesting lots and lots of, uh, of fruit, for example, in, in a city. They're doing it all for free. They're taking apples and pears and what have you from people's trees, whether it's in their backyards or in public place. And the people doing it are getting paid money to do it. And so... I'm really interested in the business model of how they actually do that. How do they actually achieve uh, that sort of sort of thing? Now, the other thing I'm looking at is operations. So things like the how they schedule and seasonal cycles throughout the year. 
uh, the harvesting cycle, the tree pruning um, cycle, which is a huge thing, with, uh, particularly with apples. Um, resourcing, how do I resource their different projects? Uh, community, tr community training and capacity building. There's some pretty amazing programs out there uh, in London, for example, there's the uh, Certificate in Community Orcharding, uh, the KIKO, very popular uh, program in, uh, in London and, and the UK. Uh, I want to get a bit of a handle on site safety. So if you're harvesting um, big fruit trees in a public place uh, with volunteers, how do you manage site safety? And then volunteer strategies, how do you um, engage volunteers, have an active and committed uh, volunteer group? I'm looking at yields. What does yields mean? Well, I, I take a really big and wide view about what yields actually means. Um, I look at not just the, the quantities of food, but also the more intang intangible yields like the experience that people have, the positive effects that these places have on people's mental health, um, the educational aspects of community agroforestry and, and community orchards. Uh, I look at design and, and plant selection as well. I've been talking to some really great people like Martin Crawford in the UK around uh, design and Lincoln Smith in the United States. Uh, design and, and plant selection. And the other really key thing I'm looking at is livelihood. So how can people sustain a livelihood in the community food food sector, in the community food sector? That to me is one of the really important aspects of being able to do this work. So Morag, if we go on to the last slide. So some more, some more imagery here. Um, and I haven't explained what a food forest actually is. And I'm assuming the audience might know that, but please ask me um, during, uh, uh, during questions if you want to know more about that. So if you sort of go going in clockwise uh, from the top, top left. So I talked a little bit about yields um, and some of, these, some of these projects, they are harvesting so much food. So, that image there is um, from an apple harvest in about two or three hours, I think. I think it was three hours session in Seattle uh, with a group called uh, City Fruit. Um, and we harvested 800 pounds of apples from about four apple trees. Um, 800 pounds uh, is about uh, oh, 350, 350 kilograms of apples. Um, amazing to think how much food you can actually harvest from fruit trees, and these are public trees in a in a in a in a uh, public park. Um, next slide uh, in the middle at the top. Um, this is a photo from Beacon Food Forest in the United States. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in is, is the type of plants that are uh, you can you can uh, you can get food from. And this is an image of cardoon, which looks a lot like an artichoke, but actually you actually harvest the, the leaves of the cardoon and eat them. And actually they're very popular in Italian cooking, the cardoon. So amazing, I've just been blown away by the diversity of different plants um, that you can actually harvest and, and eat. Next slide, next photo looking at that. That's, this, is, this is the Life Cycles Organization in Canada. Um, they're, in a, they're a pretty amazing group. They go around and harvest uh, apples, pears, plums, and other fruit from the urban orchard. All of the fruit trees growing in the whole, in the whole of the city, including backyards and, and public places. Uh, and they've got a pretty amazing uh, information technology system, which allows people to organize and, and harvest fruit and they'll go into backyards um, and do that work. As I said, last year they harvested 80,000 pounds. So get that in your head, 80,000 pounds, that's about 35 tonnes of, of fruit from people's backyards um, in, 
and they're they're in the city of Victoria, in um, in Canada, a small city of about three hundred fifty thousand people. So bottom right, um, this is a this is a, a picture of a top chef uh, Theo in in Rotterdam, and Theo is holding a stick of Chinese toon, uh, tuna tuna chinensis. And one of the things I've been really interested, like I said, is partnering. Um, so this top restaurant in, in Rotterdam called Oasis, uh, they're really interested in the flavors of the food forest and they are buying uh, product from food forests in Rotterdam to incorporate those flavors uh, into their into their cuisine and let me start, let me tell you i mean their food is just amazing it's the sorts of flavors they're getting from food forests uh, are, are quite quite incredible uh, and, they, and so they're value adding in the restaurant using the flavors of the food forest the other thing i found uh, really important in my research is uh, communication uh, and signage uh, particularly for food forests uh, that are can be quite challenging to understand uh, or um, in, in inverted commas read uh, when people visit a food forest they might not be able to recognize it as easily as perhaps a vegetable patch or an orchard so i've been looking at signage and communication a lot and then lastly i've been looking at the user experience how people experience these places when they're in them um, and in my in my uh, research and process, I do a lot of sketching and drawing in food forests um, to understand them. And so that's just one of my little sketches uh, from a food forest in Miami. Kevin, thank you. So, you have to, um, yeah. So look, there's, there's a, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Borak. And look, there's a lot of work I need to do. I'm going to be producing a report. Um, hopefully at the end of this year, beginning of next year, and that'll be, that will be made available for people to, to look at. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone. Uh, I, 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 any, are there any questions? Well, I've got, um, I've got lots of questions and I know there's questions and um, also lots of comments coming through in the chat. Um, yeah. I'm wondering whether we might just um, go across to Fiona now and explore with her. And then while you while we're doing that, you could be looking in the chat and we'll come back and we'll talk together a bit more, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, let me just stop sharing my screen. And um, thank you, Gav. It's I'm I'm really excited about the things that you're like just the the rich detail of the of the those, the fabric of the urban environment that you're that you're seeing in terms of the food systems, those details, you know, things like that, that um, the harvesting throughout the city. What kind of system is needed to do that? And examples. As soon as you start to see, and it opens up the possibilities, then of thinking, oh, well, yeah, actually, the solution to that issue. You know, often people talk about, oh, it's just so much wastage in the city, or what do you do when it all falls? Will you? actually create new employment by going and harvesting it. It's a new a new position. So I think there's lots of different things that we can we can pick up and talk about. And there was a question there too, Gav, about um, maybe you could come back around to like what is what is a food forest and what is a community food forest? Um, so some people have been answering that. There's a bit of um, conversation going on there already. So I don't know if you can see that on your on your phone, but if you'd like to dive in there and have a look, and and we'll invite um, Fiona to to join us in the spotlight now. Welcome, Fiona. Thank you. So Fiona is, as I said before, a an urban farmer, and uh, she's absolutely passionate about growing plants, and particularly food plants, uh, and. As a, as a teacher, she worked with teenagers uh, and saw a lot about the benefit of them, particularly mental health benefits of growing food. And also as an as a urban grower, she's seen the firsthand the demand for her fresh food. And so her question that she went off to explore as a Churchill Fellowship was really how to become an urban grower in Australia. 
and to look at some of the, the possibilities and the opportunities. Um, and really, I guess this is as a, as a livelihood potential too. So Fiona first, um, Fiona's taught permaculture design courses with David Holmgren for many years, and she's also managed the Mercy College Kitchen Garden um, for, for, from 2012 to 2019, which is a teaching garden, which sounds absolutely amazing. And I'd love to come and visit sometime because it, it grows seasonal vegetables using organic growing methods that supplies the school canteen and restaurant, um, which is phenomenal. You know, every school should have something like that. And she also now runs Ainsley Urban Farm, where she grows microgreens for local restaurants and cafes and seasonal vegetables too. And also her place has over 50 fruit trees, and nuts and berries and vegetables, two beehives, chickens. And um, someone asked me, actually, what are working rabbits? <laughs> when, they, uh, when they read your bio earlier. So welcome um, to the Urban Agriculture Masterclass, Fiona. It's lovely to have your company here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So am I ready to share screen? Oh, please go ahead. Yes. Great. Okay. Okay. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Perfect. So good evening. Thank you very much for joining us all tonight. Uh, just let's... Oh. Oh, it's the screen isn't. Oh, it's not clicking. I do try again, Morag, because it's not. Um. Oh, here we go. Great. Sorry. Um, I'm Fiona, and I operate Ainsley Urban Farm here in Canberra, where I grow soil-grown microgreens for around thirty restaurants and cafes in Canberra. So here I am in one of my greenhouses. For eight years, I taught teenagers to grow vegetables as part of the sustainability elective that I ran at Marici College. As a teacher, I consistently observed a gap in the pathway for my students who wanted a future in urban food growing. And as a business operator working in the food industry, I've become increasingly aware of the unmet demand for locally grown fresh food. These two factors led me to apply for a Churchill Fellowship to investigate enterprises providing vocational pathways for aspiring food growers. I believe that urban farm training and incubators can overcome the two obstacles to becoming an urban farmer, lack of skills and access to land. I was awarded the fellowship in 2020 Here's the little just diagram showing those two factors that um, led to the idea of um, urban farm hubs and incubators and researching them. So I was awarded the fellowship in 2020 and I undertook travel to the US, Canada, the UK and the Netherlands this year from July until October. I chose to have one week immersive experiences at urban farm training enterprises in each country then I arranged other visits to other enterprises, small farms and industry around those intensives. Growing home in Englewood, Chicago, absolutely stole my heart. It's an organic farm on three acres in one of the poorest neighbourhoods in Chicago. And I always forget to mention here, this food you see growing is growing on concrete, so all the farms in Chicago, the food is growing in two feet of compost and soil on concrete. Growing Home provides a paid 12-week training program with true wraparound support for people with multiple barriers to employment. 85% of the participants have been incarcerated. People here learn how to grow food, study environmental literacy, and complete an intense self-development program as well as job readiness training. The employment rate of over 80% is evidence of the effectiveness of this life-changing program that uses food growing as a vehicle for personal transformation. Windy City Harvest, under the auspices of the Chicago Botanic Garden, is an integrated operation offering a continuum of paid training programs across 15 urban farms in Chicago. The youth program is for school children aged 15 to 18. Core, 
is a 13 week program for people who've been involved in the criminal justice system and war veterans. Both youth and core graduates are eligible for the paid apprenticeship program. After this, participants can apply to join the incubator program where aspiring farmers are supported to start their own farm business on one eighth to one quarter of an acre at Legends Incubator Farm, which is pictured in the center here. Deshaun on the left said to me, I have found my calling and explained the greatest privilege is that I am able to employ two people who are passionate about changing the food system. He is about to start farming on a 20 acre block in Chicago with another Legends farmer. Casey on the right, was equally inspired and inspiring, saying, you learn more than just farming. You learn life skills. You get confidence. And he concluded, there's a future in urban farming. There's got to be. Soul Food Street Farms is an urban farm on three acres in downtown Vancouver. This place was instrumental in inspiring me to apply for a Churchill Fellowship. Vegetables and fruit are grown in custom-made boxes neatly arranged in rows and blocks. Soul food employs people who have barriers to employment, such as homelessness, addiction, and mental illness. They work to produce up to 30 tonnes of fresh food per year, which provides 30 to 50% of the operating costs. I worked here for one week alongside staff, some who have been here since the beginning when it started in 2009. One of the wonderful women that I got to work with said to me, this is my farm family. She pointed and said, see over there, that's my farm dad. This beautiful caring oasis provides meaningful work and connection with the earth, plants and people. Again, stealing my heart. The Intervale Centre is the oldest farm incubator in the US. It's in Burlington, Vermont. What I saw at Intervale was the culmination of a vision set over 40 years ago. The key message from this successful farm incubator was to identify and preserve land for growing food where people live. This one action 40 years ago has enabled the establishment of successful farms via the incubator program. So successful, in fact, that the whole valley is filled with organic incubator farms to feed the people of Vermont. And the incubator has now transitioned to being a farm business advisory service. Viva Farms is a bilingual farm incubator in Washington State. Currently, it's on 103 acres with 34 incubator farms, ranging in size from one quarter to 25 acres. The first step is to enrol in the 30 week practicum, which delivers two hours of evening classes and requires a minimum of four hours of independent work on the half acre student farm. Upon completion, students can apply to join the incubator program where they are supported to start their own business. Viva talks about five pillars of support that they provide, which are training, access to land, shared infrastructure and equipment, capital and marketing. Rob Smith, the director of programs on the left-hand side there, described the impact to me. We are following through on our mission. People who come to this program are able to start viable farm businesses. We have farmers who started at the bottom being a poorly paid farm worker and now have become business owners and built wealth. This has a huge impact. Pictured on the right-hand side is one of these farmers, Francisco, who started on half an acre in year one on the incubator and now in year three is successfully farming eight acres. Woodbank in Manchester is the production and training farm for the Kindling Trust's Farm Start program, where people can start the journey of learning to be a farmer. This land-based training program runs from February until the end of October for two days a week. Students can progress on their own pace through levels one, two, and three. This three acre farm is surrounded by houses, which hopefully you can see there in Stockport. It's vegan and organic. 
There is a larger farm that will provide incubator space and be a home for a large agroforestry project. Woodbank is a truly replicable exemplar of an urban farm training program where the production and training targets are well balanced. Another type of training program I visited was at University of Vermont that offers a land-based practicum in sustainable agriculture. Students have theory classes and three days a week work on the university farm and one day a week on a partner training farm. As I saw on all training farms, there is a balancing act between education and production. However, one of the advantages of this type of learning is that students learn in a group. They have a shared experience. Ava on the right, who is a graduate of the program said to me, I loved all of it. It was a transformational experience coming here for six months. It was the first time I felt deeply in relationship with place. Rachel on the left, who directs the program, spoke about the many graduates now working in farming. In fact, one of the graduates of this program was the farm manager at Soul Foods when I was there. The University of British Columbia in Vancouver also offers a practicum in sustainable agriculture on their 60 acre certified organic farm on the city campus. The farm produces vegetable and fruit, in fact, the best blueberries I've ever tasted, they're on the left. For farmers markets held on site, a CSA, wholesale customers and a local food shelf. In this program, students attend three days a week and complete five to seven hours of farm work in their own time, learning techniques that are involved in both small scale and large scale vegetable growing. Catherine and Alejandra, who teach in the program, who are pictured there on the right, said to me, we're genuinely pumping out people with a critical understanding of food systems and agriculture who are not afraid to jump in. People are learning a lot and getting really connected to the community. In the Netherlands, I lived in at the Vamonderhof, which is the biodynamic farm training school that offers two, three and four year seriously comprehensive farm training programs. Pictured here are three young women in fourth year who are all intending to continue farming after they graduate. It was truly inspiring to visit so many successful programs training the next generation of farmers. Australia really needs farm training programs and incubators. The National Farmers Federation have also identified that we need this. I set out to see what urban farm training could achieve and everything I saw confirmed that urban farm training programs and incubators provide skills, they build skills and capacity in individuals and communities. They do provide access to land. They spawn green farm businesses. They produce food where people live, including improving food access. They provide meaningful employment, transfer life, transform lives for the better and contribute to a wellbeing economy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fiona. And what an incredible selection of examples as well. And, and so much uh, like the recommendations that you put forward there, I think I would love for us to spend a bit of time um, chewing on um, at the end of this session, uh, because this idea of supporting young farmers, um, opening up spaces for for farms in the cities. And the example that you talked about from Vermont, for example, about making sure that there's space in the cities where farming can happen and, and how important these vocational pathways are. So um, fantastic, thank you so very much. Um, there was lots of comments and questions going on in the chat while you were speaking. So I wonder whether um, while Nick is, uh, speaking you might be able to jump in there and then we'll come back around to to all of us again at the end so um welcome welcome to nick i'm glad you're able to join us i just wanted to quickly introduce nick uh because uh nick is actually the creator of this urban agriculture month and he's a been a passionate advocate for food sovereignty and sustainable food systems in Australia for a long time. Nick and I have, have collaborated in various events 
um, through his organisation, Sustain, the Australian Food Network. Uh, so he's the executive director and founder of Sustain, um, and he's also the editor of a book, Fair Food, Stories from a Movement Changing the World, and the co-editor of Reclaiming the Urban Commons, the Past, Present and Future of Food Growing in Australian Towns and Cities a few years ago. Um, Nick is also a lecturer in food systems, food policy and governance, and food movements for William Anglis Institute in Melbourne in their Bachelor of Food Studies and the Master of Food Systems and Gastronomy. Nick um, is dedicated to working with communities, institutions, enterprises and organisations around Australia to co-create this vision um, and practice of fair food. And as I understand it, speaking up and speaking out and helping to bring about this change into levels of government and organisationally um, in ways that is absolutely essential. So thank you so much, Nick, for joining us and I'll hand over to you now. Uh, thanks uh, Thanks very much, Morag. Um, it's great to be with you all. I just wanted to check that you can, my sound's coming through okay? Your sound is fine and your picture is fine. Terrific. All right. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for that warm introduction and thank you Morag and Stacey and all the team for helping us launch Urban Agriculture Month in such fantastic style with, uh, with the great presentations from Gavin and Fiona. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri and Wurundjeri peoples of the Kulin Nation and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to any First Nations persons who may be in the room tonight or otherwise watching us uh, later. So it's wonderful to be able to join as part of a, a Churchill Fellowship panel um, uh, in this uh, Urban Agriculture Masterclass, uh, hearing uh, from Fiona um, and Gavin certainly you know, brings me back to 2014 when I had the great good fortune to go on my Churchill trip investigating innovative models of urban agriculture in the US Midwest, Toronto and Argentina with a particular focus on um, uh, underserved neighbourhoods, places like Southside Chicago, Northside Milwaukee, Detroit, um, various parts of Toronto and many provinces in Argentina where urban agriculture was really critical to food security uh, for many communities, as well as to livelihood opportunities and employment and education pathways. And this uh, work has only increased in relevance and importance as, uh, as time has gone on. Um, so these are just a few photos. I had a, a wonderful couple of months um, traveling in those places, met over 150 people, visited, I think, 90 different organizations, um, ran myself into the ground doing it, but had a, a wonderful and inspiring time and, and all these people and so many more uh, ongoing sources of inspiration for the work that I do with Sustain. So uh, for those who are not familiar with um, my organisation Sustain, uh, we were established uh, as a national sustainable food systems not-for-profit organisation and health promotion charity in January 2016. Over the last seven years, we've been clear that the expansion of multifunctional urban agriculture is central to the realisation of this vision that you can see on the screen. We've pursued this agenda through three national urban agriculture forums in 2016, 2018 and 2021, the establishment of urban farms in Alphington and Preston in Melbourne and support for the formation of the United African Farm in Pakenham the publishing of an anthology, Reclaiming the Urban Commons, the Past, Present and Future of Food Growing in Australian Towns and Cities. And I'm delighted uh, to recall that Moreg, uh, you have a chapter uh, in that anthology. And uh, the publication of a national pandemic gardening survey that received over 9,000 responses that we uh, conducted in July 2020. Um, and most recently, which I'll touch on at the end of this presentation, a mapping study of the state of urban agriculture uh, in Victoria. Um, so uh, first of all, just a bit of scene setting, and I'm sure with this audience, um, nobody needs reminding of why uh, permaculture, urban agriculture, and all things related are so very important right now. But um, uh, you know, the, the times we're living through are sobering and concerning. Um, you know, I've, I've written and I firmly believe that we're entering a decade the likes of which none of us have ever experienced. Crises are cascading and converging on us. Climate, COVID, cost of living, war and health, mental, physical and dietary. 
And in particular, more Australians than ever before are facing food insecurity with food banks being swamped by demand. Um, just in terms of just one example amongst the many in terms of the, the vulnerabilities of the, uh, the, the large industrialised food system, um, eggs, uh, these are um, some headlines from, uh, from earlier this year uh, in the wake of um, what's been happening overseas. The, the it's not simply consumers who are paying increasing costs for petrol, uh, energy and food, it's also producers. Um, and this is going to flow through into the price we're all going to be paying for food uh, in the coming months uh, and years. So, um, you know, egg farmers are uh, one group of people who are at the sharp end of that. Um, and here, this uh, chart just kind of like breaks down um, uh, the middle of this year, the sorts of year on year increases that, uh, that Australian farmers um, are, are confronted with. And then, of course, we have the, uh, you know, the big one that we all are very familiar with, uh, with climate change, um, you know, the way that impacts on the food system is, uh, is, is multiple. Um, in Victoria, we've been living through pretty full on floods and, and rainfall in the last, uh, the last little while, of course, in, in Queensland and in New South Wales, uh, most of this year has been characterised by floods. A couple of years ago, it was, uh, it was rains. Um, and then there's the, uh, you know, the, the, the warming, um, patterns and, and what that is going to mean for, for year, what it already is meaning for our food yields and what it will do uh, going forward. Um, but, you know, the good news uh, is that there are alternatives. Um, I'm sure many of you here in the room tonight are at the forefront of leading that change. Um, this is, you know, this is the story of food sovereignty, of agroecology, of urban agriculture, regenerative agriculture, permaculture. Uh, all these movements, um, you know, their time has really come uh, now because they are, uh, as Via Campesina argues, a really critical part of the solution to these um, to these challenges that we're facing. Um, so we are in Urban Agriculture Month. It's uh, it's great to be able to launch that uh, this evening. Um, this map is now out of date. Uh, um, I think it was 130 odd events when um, with this green trap was taken. We're now at nearly 150. Um, if you have not yet visited urbanagriculturemonth.org.au, please do um, have a look at all the wonderful events that are taking place all around the country. If you are involved with a community garden or an urban farm or something similar, um, and you might have a, you know, an opportunity to host a, an open day or a farm tour or garden tour or workshop in uh, November, uh, please do. Please help us raise the profile of this movement and um, you know, really uh, uh, drive home the message that it has such a critical role to play um, in the uh, in the challenges that we're facing. Um, uh, now, I think Australia is a little bit um, behind the times in some ways, and I'm interested to know what uh, Fiona and Gavin uh, think of that, having just come back from their Churchill trips. But I feel that um, there are other countries that are further ahead of us, uh, certainly in terms of their scope of their ambition and the targets they're setting themselves in terms of food self-sufficiency uh, domestic production and really supporting the people who are doing all that fantastic work, um, be it uh, in their back gardens, their verges, their school gardens, community gardens, or, or, their, or their urban farms or peri-urban farms. Singapore, um, uh, to our north, recently set itself a target of 30% food self-sufficiency by 2030. Um, and that's been backed up by um, large funding commitments, including a $60 million agri-food cluster transformation fund. Um, the gentleman that you see there pictured is Bjorn Lowe, um, the founder of Edible Garden City. That's, um, and he's, he and his team are doing a fantastic work um, as part of the, uh, the green transformation of, uh, of Singapore. Um, going a bit further north, um, we come to Seoul. I don't know if anyone's been to Seoul or read anything about Seoul. Um, I was invited there a few years ago to speak at an urban agriculture conference they were having, I think it was 2018. Um, uh, you see there just, uh, just the scope of their ambition, um, starting with 45,000 urban farmers a decade ago. Um, uh, they've set themselves a target of 1 million urban farmers in a city of 10 million people uh, by uh, the year 2024. And that is backed by an investment of 216 million US dollars, so about 260 million Australian dollars um, to expand patches of land for farming, teach farming skills and build communities of urban farmers um, and expand their growing space to 240 hectares, uh, including vertical gardens, farms on rooftops, building walls, 
uh, and so on. So it's um, you know a big ambition and big uh, funding commitment by the city of Seoul to get to that target. Um, over um, to the other side of the world, uh, we have Boston um, in Massachusetts. Um, the newly elected mayor, Michelle Wu, ran on a platform of urban agriculture and food justice. Um, as soon as she came into office, she announced two new departments in the city of Boston, the Office of Food Justice and Grow Boston, the Office of Urban Agriculture. Um, uh, and that's all um, supported by a 66-page food justice agenda for a resilient Boston, which is um, country leading in the context of the United States in terms of um, where urban agriculture uh, can get to. So um, bringing that back to Melbourne, um, some of the work that we've been doing is transforming an abandoned vicarage um, in, uh, in Preston, in Melbourne's north, um, the Oak Hill Food Justice Farm, we call it, um, over, the, uh, over the last 12 months um, with support from the city of Darabin and um, a two-year Peppercorn lease from the Anglican Church, um, uh, working with a, a permaculturalist from Bellingen, Charlie Brennan, you see there with the cap, um, uh, who spends his time between Michigan, actually, uh, New South Wales, um, and some other places. Uh, and he uh, helped um, do the co-design for the transformation of, uh, of that abandoned vicarage into the Oak Hill Food Justice Farm. And one of the really lovely uh, things that has come out of that, which wasn't intended or planned, but um, when you create these spaces, these um, you know these collaborations manifest. The Preston Primary School down the road did not have a school garden on their site, and their teachers and principals said to us, "Would you you know consider uh, organising a hands-on learning project for our kids?" Um, uh, and we were able to do that, and it's been a whole of school project involving all 680 of their students from years one to year six. Uh, coming to uh, Oak Hill uh, one day a week uh, for a hands-on learning um, Preston Primary Passata uh, program, we call it, uh, learning about food growing from soil to stomach. Um, so just in the last couple of minutes, just to wrap up, this is the research that we've just launched, um, which you can find on our website. I'll share the link shortly. Uh, commissioned by Agriculture Victoria to do a survey of the Victorian urban agriculture sector, growing edible towns and cities, it's called. Um, just very briefly, um, some key findings uh, from the 153 people from community gardens and commercial farmers who completed this survey. Um, it's a young and dynamic sector. Um, more than half of the participants, are, or just about half, are under the age of 45, which um, contrasts with the average age of the Australian farmer being close to, close to 60. Um, and a lot of them are in startup phase or wanting to grow and, diverse, and diversify. They're really um, seeing opportunities and really wanting to um, expand their um, organisations and their businesses and very strongly underpinned by values. Um, as you see there, what's important to them is creating a healthy food system, healthy urban environments, tackling climate change, building self-sufficiency for communities. Um, what's not so important to them are... Um, uh, you know, monetary considerations and, and new markets. Um, so uh, just to quickly wrap this up in terms of some of the barriers, um, grants is a big one, over-reliance on volunteers and burnout and the challenge accessing land and premises are all kind of like top of the list in terms of what's holding people back. And that uh, forms the basis for what we call our roadmap for transformation, which is a you know, detailed um, set of recommendations over the next uh, five to 10 years for local and state governments and other actors uh, across all these different um, pillars uh, to really uh, create a comprehensive plan to massively scale up the urban agriculture sector, not just in Victoria, but nationally. Um, so that's what, um, that's what we're campaigning on. That's what Urban Agriculture Month is about for us. Um, and this is, you know, examples of... Uh, of what, uh, of what we are recommending. So yeah, it's all there in the report. There's a lot of detail there, um, but uh, I think I will leave it there in the interest of time and uh, uh, hopefully having a bit of time for questions and answers and discussion. Uh, back to you, Moreg. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you, Nick. I'm really encouraged by what your research is showing about the, the growth of that youth sector in farming and how urban farming is a youth farming movement and how that's kind of changing the dynamic. I'm also really excited to, 
to talk with you too about the idea of targets and um, how we can change um, change what we're doing. How do we how do we change that scope of ambition that we have? I think perhaps in the urban agriculture sector in Australia, possibly our scope has been so local in terms of what we're doing with all of our communities, which is absolutely essential. It's the, the basis of it. But how do we now um, vision that and connect that? And I guess that's what you're doing. So I wonder whether we could maybe talk that about that a bit more too. But um, perhaps, Stacey, if you could bring Gavin and Fiona back into the screen on Spotlight as well. Uh, and also let everyone know, if you'd like to ask a question, you could, um, down below, there's these little reaction buttons. If you, uh, hopefully on your system, you've got this. So if you can put your hand up like that, it'll bump you to the top of the queue and be able to see that you're asking a question. Um, so I, before we open up to uh, questions from those who are watching this, I wonder whether there was anything that any of you here, Fiona, Gav, or Nick wanted to pick up on what someone else has said, uh, because all of you are deeply immersed in this, but from different perspectives. Um, yeah, I'll pick up on the youth thing. Um, so we definitely noticed everywhere we went, the farmers were young. I don't know if people noticed in my slides, even some of the instructors were young. So it's definitely... Um, a happening thing with youth, which for me just highlights why it's really important that we get more training happening um, and that we also tap into all these people who are keen at school or the people at school that don't even know that this is a career option and provide a pathway for them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to add to that because... Um, Fiona mentioned how young people were in, you know, and that's in the, I guess, the market gardening, private farming sector, but also in some of these best practice projects that I've looked at, the, the volunteer cohort are quite young. I don't know about folks who are involved in community gardens in Australia, but are the, are the volunteer cohort young in Australia? No. Generally not. They're generally, they're generally an, an older cohort. So one of the things I've been looking at is how, how the heck do they get young people involved? And a lot of it is around sort of a really simple idea about having fun, about making this an enjoyable experience. People just come down on a Tuesday afternoon after work, they do a bit of gardening, they get, they get some stuff done. They have a few beers at the end of it and it's, a, it's just an enjoyable activity. You know, it's just a really simple thing about how can you bring the element of fun into into the uh, into the place, um, and people have to make choices, don't they? You know, we're, we're quite busy these days, and um, you have to make a choice about what you want to do on a Tuesday night. I'm going to go and go down to my local community garden, do some do some work, meet some mates, have a few beers. Um, yeah, really simple idea. Uh, so yeah, how to yes yeah, you anyway, know, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Kev. I wonder, you know, this idea of pathways for young people as farmers, and, and you know, you've, you've all mentioned this about urban agriculture being kind of a youth movement. Where do you think the, the motivating force for that is coming from and what greater levels of support do you feel that we need to wrap around this to, to amplify this even further? I mean, you've talked about a few yeah. things, but how would, you, how would you articulate that? You know? um, I'll weigh in on that first. A couple of things. Firstly, in order to make training programs accessible, like it's really great to have paid training programs. So those programs in Chicago where people were actually paid to do this, like it really places a value on it and it actually makes it accessible and provides a pathway. Um, in another program I visited that was unpaid, the guy told me he had to sacrifice $90,000 a year to do the program because he couldn't work while he was studying and he still had to live. So there's not many people, like you have to be super privileged to be able to do that. So 
if we want farming to be a trendy thing for privileged people, we can make it inaccessible. But if we want it to be accessible to everyone and improve everyone's quality of life, um, we have to value it more and we have to be prepared to pay people to do the training. So, um, yeah, I guess that's, that's, that's my thought on that one. Thanks, Fiona. Have you got any thoughts on that, Nick, in terms of how to, how to support these programs getting off the ground? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the, the, the examples I gave from, you know, Singapore and Seoul um, and Boston show that where they're serious about it, they invest in it and they don't just say, well, you know, this is nice little niche activities and, you know, the community gardeners are all volunteers and they can just kind of do it because, you know, they believe in it. Um, or it's, um, you know, uh, people can just kind of like fund it themselves and, and it's not something that we need to be involved in. Um, where it's really, you know, making inroads and having impact, it's it's been significantly supported in, in various ways. And that's what we've laid out in, that's what the research shows. Um, uh, that was certainly what I took away from my Churchill Fellowship. I and mean, when I went to Argentina, um, you know, it's the federal government that is investing, you know, hugely in this. Um, and it's from the perspective of food security. I mean, it's a, it's an anti, urban agriculture is an anti-poverty strategy at, and funded by the federal government and supported by, you know, cohorts of, uh, of trainers and people who are, um, you know, teaching and training people and supporting people to get into this, uh, into this sector. So, um, yeah, that's what we're calling on, uh you know, state and federal government here to do. I mean, the Pandemic Gardening Survey, we called for a $500 million urban agriculture fund, and that sounds like a lot of money until you look at the Productivity Commission, which in 2019 said mental health alone in Australia was costing us $180 billion a year in direct and indirect costs, let alone dietary-related ill health, and another 30 or $40 billion on top of that. So... You know, if we as taxpayers are paying over $200 billion a year to deal with, you know, huge health crises, um, you know, surely it's very good value for money to spend a, a fraction of that um, supporting the kinds of initiatives that Fiona's talking about and Gavin's talking about and I'm talking about. That's, that's, what, that's the case that we're making. Um, and I think if we're, if we're really serious about it, that's what we need to be doing. And the, the other thing I, I'd like to add to that is... Sometimes we feel disempowered because we think the only solution available is to, is to go through government, is to attract funding and policy initiatives from government. But the projects that I've looked at, a, a lot of the, <clears throat> the groups are, are working around government, they're not even bothering with government, um, and they're, part, they're partnering with other organisations, schools, churches, um, uh, other groups, either um, getting access to their land or access um, to funds. Uh, some of them are, so for example, um, the community, the Philadelphia Orchard Project, uh, which I spent a week in Philadelphia with those guys, they, uh, are partnering with organisations that have a health and wellbeing agenda and they're saying to those organisations, look, we can help your, your group achieve its goals around health and wellbeing and this is how we can do it using the community orchard model. And so they're attracting funds from those community groups um, and partnering in that way. So... So there are solutions around um, attracting uh, uh, partners, financial partners, land partners that don't necessarily uh, directly involve involve government. And some of these groups are, are, are ser you know are serious um, players, like the, the the Orchard Project. The Orchard Project in the UK, they're a £750,000 charity operating in uh, 540 orchards across the UK and employ 17 people. Um, 
and yes, they attract some government money, they attract cor corporate sponsorships, and they have a whole lot of different partnering arrangements, and they focus a lot on fundraising. So I think there's some positive avenues as, um, coming out of my research that I can I can see. Yeah, government is important. We need to get government on board. Um, uh, in Australia, we I, I agree with Nick. We are behind in terms of the policy space. Um, just across the ditch in New Zealand, uh, the Christchurch City um, government there has a policy of being the most edible city in the world. Um, and they're putting in policy uh, strategies in place to, to meet that policy. Um, so yeah, government has a really important role to play. There's no doubt about that, but there are, there are workarounds as well that uh, the groups that I've been uh, talking to have been uh, have been getting into as well. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I think this idea of you know not waiting until the conditions are perfect to get going, find a way, find your partners, find how you can do it, find some land, find support, and you know, and then you know do what you can where you are with what you have, and and start to amplify that. But I think what we're also saying here too, isn't it, that the sharing of these stories globally that you're all investigating and the research that's happening um, going deeper into the benefits of urban agriculture gives such a body of evidence that we need to pay attention to this because it, as as you were talking about Nick early in your presentation that all of those different multiple crises that we're facing in the world right now we can address front on with uh, through this lens of urban agriculture in all of its diversity of forms. And so I'm wondering too, because I know that you are at the university, uh, well, at the Wing William Anglis College and, and running these programs, what kind of research are you seeing at universities that are helping to dive deeper into this? And what, what other types of research are we missing that we really need to do? Because I know there's people in this audience who are uh, also academics and uh, who have the possibility of, of helping to support greater levels of, of, of research into this. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Morag. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's lots of great research going on. There's, um, yeah, there's, there's seems to be more and more, um, seeing more and more PhD students who are, you know, getting into um, sustainable food systems and urban agriculture, which is really, really fantastic. Um, I think, um, I think, uh, I mean, what, just to give one example that's been going on for a long time um, is the, um, the Food Print Melbourne research. Some people might have, uh, might have heard of that, might have been um, come across that. Rachel Carey at, at uh, Melbourne University has been doing that for many years now, funded by the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation. Um, that's really good research on looking at an integrated approach to protecting peri-urban land and looking at uh, using recycled water, um, creating markets for farmers and, you know, essentially relocalising re the food system to make it, you know, climate resilient, climate proof. So that's um, really great research. I think, um, I think a gap could be, and this is something that we're very interested in, would be to look at a kind of life cycle assessment approach to urban agriculture and particularly the soil carbon sequestration potential. We hear a lot about um, soil carbon with, um, you know, with the broad acre agriculture and, you know, out, out in rural um, areas. But what about in cities? Um, what's happening, you know, in community gardens and in wicking beds and, and those kind of things, uh, you know, composting, all that. Um, uh, so really getting a, a handle on that and not just all carbon, but, um, you know, nutrient density, microbial life, what's happening in the soil, um, you know, the whole life cycle assessment, you know, the, the food miles and all of it. Um, and documenting, you know, the real um, carbon and ecological and social footprint of, um, of urban food would be a, a really great thing to do, um, as well as the, um, you know, the social uh, the social benefits. And there's a lot of research around that. I've got a good friend at Swinburne University, Jonathan Kingsley, um, who's done a lot of research on the mental health and psychological benefits of community gardening and, and urban agriculture, and um, you know, from from that perspective. So. 
um, it's look, it's a rich area of uh, of research. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more to do, um, uh, and that's you know why we've been why we've been talking about urban agriculture for all the time that we have. Um, why we've been doing the urban agriculture forums to really bring together the practitioners and the the researchers and the policy makers and build this understanding to understand it as a really strong and emerging sector in Australia. Um, and to yeah to share all these inspiring stories and practice um, uh, that's uh, that's what this month is about and and that's what we'll be doing uh, this time next year with another national urban agriculture forum. Mm, thanks, Nick. I can see that um, another Nick has his hand up, who I thought was you at the start, Nick. So we had a bit of a Nick confusion. Come on in, Nick. <laughs> yeah, well. I'm not surprised you were confused because uh, same name and we used to live in the same town of Bellingen. And um, when Gavin was talking about the role of government, I was just busting to say something because I um, have worked as a landscape designer in Bellingen and there's a rule that anyone who subdivides has to plant street trees every 10 metres unless they're in the way of power lines or um, underground water or there's like car visibility exercises that you go through. So um, I've done all that and, uh, and proposed planting edible street trees like macadamia and that, like there's so many trees that you could plant that would um, work really well and council wouldn't have anything to do with it and so-called um, hippie town they just would not support the planting of any edible tree. And they said, because there'll be rats and vermin. And um, so I, d I just couldn't win with them. And so the solution was that people like private clients would come to me and say, can we plant street trees? And I'd say, sure, um, off the record. And we can go through all of these exercises with, is it gonna be in the way of power lines um, the phone, water, car visibility, and if it's not going to be in anyone's way, then no one will notice if you plant. And and um, so it's it's actually much easier to get street trees, edible street trees planted when private people just take the initiative and are aware of of how government works. But we we can't work with them until they catch up, kind of thing. Thanks, Nick. Would anyone, excuse me, like to, to respond to that? Because I think, you know, shifting perceptions within council of what's possible is happening in places and not in others, as we can hear. Would anyone like to respond to that? Thanks, Nick. Yeah, look, I'll, um, yeah I, I, look I, I'm, I hear what everyone's saying about governments and, and um, yeah, I, I, I think this is, you know, they, they deserve the criticism that comes their way um, uh, through, you know, sort of like, you know, really short-sighted approaches and risk aversion and, and their caution. And, you know, I, I feel the pain of everyone who's kind of like come up against those um, those barriers. I mean, you know, the at Oak Hill in Preston, we wanted to have um, a pop-up market for young people in the car park that's part of our lease um, just for half a day, like one Saturday for half a day. And it got to the planning department at Darabin Council and they said, oh, oh, you're changing the use from it being a car park to something else, that'll be $1,200, please, um, just to put in your application to, <laughs> to for us to even consider whether, you know, you can use it for that pop-up market for that one, you know, half day, um, just crazy stuff. Um, but um, I do, uh, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, government are a fact of life. Um, you know, we all pay taxes, you know, we live in a, in a, you know, a society where there's legislation and rules and regulations. Um, and if we, you know, I, I really do believe that if we really want this sector to, to grow and expand and be massive, um, we need to get them on board. And there are good people in government that are, um, you know, wanting to support this work. And the research that I've shared with you was commissioned by the state government in Victoria, by Agriculture Victoria, because there are policy people at quite a senior level in that you know, which is which is the agriculture department of Victoria, which is, you know, forever only been about chemical agriculture and export. Um, there are people in there now who want to, you know, try and um, uh, create space for something called urban agriculture and see how that can be uh, supported. And it, 
Um, you know, so I, I, I believe in engaging with government and in terms of, um, uh, you know, getting, getting results, um, you know, there are many councils now in Victoria that have got dedicated food policies that have got a staff who resource those food policies that work very closely with community gardeners and others and that are wanting to see this sector grow and expand um, in constructive and positive ways and work around these roadblocks and obstacles. And my theory of change on this um, is that uh, the more, you know, good examples we have of, um, you know, supportive councils that really get urban ag and permaculture and other things and want to support it, um, then it kind of, you know, shames um, the councils that are recalcitrant and they feel left behind and, you know, that's one thing that they don't like is being um, seen to be, um, you know, um, really uh, behind the time. So we're seeing we're seeing it um, move forward. Um, we've just started some work with the city of Banyul in Melbourne that are developing their first ever urban food strategy. Um, in November, we'll be consulting with over 500 residents and businesses and you know urban farmers in Banyul. Um, and that council will be endorsing its first ever urban food strategy by May next year. And hopefully that will be an, um, an example for other councils to follow suit, not just in Victoria, but elsewhere. And I think that, you know, that's the thing, isn't it? You, when you start to see what's happening in other parts of the world and you start to tell the story, you start to get things happening and it keeps, it ripples kind of faster once there is a body of, yeah. of, ex, of examples and, and uh, councils who are, who are brave enough to, to step up. Um, I've got two yeah. questions here, so I'm just going to drop in, drop in, um, drop in Nina. Good day, Nina. Hang on, let me just spotlight you. There we go. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Morag. Thanks for a uh, great this space. I want to ask um, something about how we can build a practical utopia. Because we uh, always are working on how we can reimagine the future that we want, but I would love to ask uh, to to uh, any one of the panelists about how is the world that they would love to live in, and uh, what we have to do for it. Like the three, the three uh, principal key uh, actions that we have to take to get there. So how it would look like this ideal uh, Melbourne, let's say Melbourne or big cities in the next five years? And what are the three key uh, actions that we have to take today? Thanks. Oh, that's a, that's a massive, um, that's, that's a big question. Um, but let me, let me try and chip in on that one. Um, I, th I think it starts simply, I mean, it, like, like, you know, just having the conversations with people in your community about what your about what your vision actually is, um, and then drilling down into the detail, because the devil's in the detail. You know, um, how how are you going to make this work? Um, whatever that vision might be, some of the some of the projects, organisations I've I've been I've been looking at and working with. Um, Need to be. They've, they've, they've been patient over long periods of time um, to develop their ideas and, and get their their vision onto the ground. Um, <clears throat> there's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, some of these mobs have taken five years plus to get there to get onto the ground. If, you know, they started off with a vision and then they got onto the ground five years later. So patience is a really important thing. And conversations, just having lots of conversations with people. Um, to build the momentum, building momentum. That's what you need to do, just keep on building momentum. I think just to, on it quickly there before anyone else jumps in and, and answers, you know, it's this slow, it's this slow, urgent action, isn't it, in a way? Yeah. And also building on that idea of the conversations too, that a shift in perception is action. That by being involved in those conversations, inviting people to share the visions and the dreams and the ideas and the possibilities, opening up that shift for that shift in perception to, to happen, whether that be talking with someone in council or talking with someone in business, talking to your neighbour across the way, talking to the principal at the local school, that shift in perception is where we need to begin. And so having these conversations, having these positive conversations, going 
into those conversations with the idea that you want to work together with people, that we're all in it together, I think is a really important place to begin. Did anyone else want to? Um... I'll, I'll jump in. Okay. Um, I guess, like, I think it's a really great question, Nina, and obviously there's lots of levels of answers, but I'll just share personally for me what has helped me. Um, I just love growing plants because plants use carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide is the thing we've got too much of. So growing plants is a really powerful action for climate change. And also we all eat at least three times a day, sometimes six or seven times a day. We all need to grow food. And if you go to a country like the Netherlands, which could fit between Sydney and Canberra and has the same population as Australia almost, there is no wasted space. We have plenty of space in our cities and in our suburbs to grow all the fresh food. Like there's just no argument about that. So we can just start growing food, like on your balcony, on your verge, on that little spot. Like if everybody did that, like one of the farmers that I met who is a world-renowned um, organic farmer, he just said we shouldn't have to grow fresh fruit and vegetables and transport them. Because if we actually all ate seasonally and grew where we lived, we would not be transporting our fresh food and our fruit around the world and eating non-seasonal stuff. And about a third of the emissions are from food, food related. So as soon as we start growing food where we eat and committing to eating seasonally, we're avoiding packaging, we're avoiding transport, we're using carbon dioxide, we're putting oxygen into the air, we're like eating fresh food. Like for me, that's the answer. Like I just go back to basics, like it's food. And that makes it so accessible too. You know, that's something yeah. that we all get. Everyone eats, everyone can plant something. Nick, I want, um, to... I, yeah, I want to say just something quickly to Nina's question um, uh, that um, uh, there's a town in Yorkshire called Todd Morden, um, which I think uh, Pamela Warhurst, one of the women who sort of driven that forward, is speaking at the National Community Gardens Australia meeting, which is happening in series in Melbourne on Saturday. Um, yeah. But that was two women who, uh, who had a vision of making that town edible and just having as much food growing in, in public places as much as possible. And they owned, you know, they were small business people, they owned cafes and they had this dream and they went out and they made it happen. Um, and I haven't been there, but it's uh, apparently pretty amazing and it's, it, it's inspired a, a worldwide movement. And for me, um, my utopia, which is captured in the title of the report that we've written, you know, growing edible towns and cities, making Australia's towns and cities edible, is changing what is normal. What is normal at the moment is fast food, unfortunately, and that's what is causing, I think, so many problems um, in so many ways. And if what was normal was um, healthy, fresh food growing in as many places as possible, um, you know, we would be in a very different, uh, in a very different reality. Um, and there's, yeah, there's so much power in that. And, uh, you know, I think one of the, and just to touch on an earlier point about why young people get involved in this, I think it's because, um, you know, it's an empowering thing to do. You know, you're taking control back over um, something that's right in front of you every day. You're doing something really meaningful. You're learning things. You're connecting with people. You're connecting with life. Um, and, you know, the food tastes good and, you know, you're making a real difference and you're really taking action in a really practical and grounded way. So um, for me, it's about scaling everything that's happening. Like we're already doing it. It's about scaling it up and making it massive. And, uh, yeah, it's, I, I, it's, it's close. I mean, I don't think we're, we're that far away. But I will just say also that somebody asked earlier about degrowth, um, and uh, I definitely think that's part of it. I think we need to move beyond a... Um, you know, growth obsessed expansion economy to, you know, steady state or even, you know, degrowth where we're, you know, we, we've reached material, um, uh, you know, fullness in terms of consumption. And, and now, you know, our future has to be about connection and quality of life and, and healing um, and time and not about this mad rat race and, you know, just, just everything for the sake of more and more money. Um, we have to get past that. So, uh, anyone who's interested in that, I'd really encourage Jason Hickle in that book. He really unpacks it in a very good way. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, you know, I just I just on that point, you made me remember, too, that um, I just heard a comment by Johan Rockström, who's uh, who's the author of the Planetary Boundaries work and uh, deeply in the. Yes, that's the book, Nina. Thank you. <laughs> 
Um, he was saying the other day that um, I am getting so frustrated that everyone keeps talking about this 1.5 degree target. It's not a target. It's an absolute limit. Our target is zero or below. We need to be drawing down. Come. Let's not set that as a, in our mind as a target because <laughs> we've already gone past it. We need to flip that. Um, <laughs> thank you, Nina. Wonderful. See you. I'm going to um, just quickly, we have like, oh, Christine, can you ask your question in, in like 30 seconds and we do a very quick response? Sorry about that, Christine. Oh, no, that's all right. Thanks very much as usual, Morag, and also Stacey behind the scenes there uh, and the speakers. It's been fabulous as usual. Uh, so much uh, in the chat. <laughs> that's the most active chat I think of any of the sessions I've been on. So thanks, everyone, for that. Uh, I just uh, have, uh, well, one thing, I'm in, uh, well, Bunyan country, Yellick Bullock for uh, Malau, Phillip Island, actually, uh, and there's so much room for partnership with Indigenous groups. Oh, it's just such a wasted resource out there. And also I think this, it's ironic that we are um, talking about food miles. You know, we've got to cut our food miles. But what do we grow? We grow exotic species from all over the world. We don't grow much in the way of, of Australian Indigenous food. So I'm just wondering what you people think about that. Are there projects that are combining those two? I mean, I know there's a lot of wild harvesting that feeds into various companies that are selling Indigenous food in various um, ways. I can, I can, um, yeah, I can Thanks. jump in here. Um, uh, I would refer you, and I'll put the link in the chat, but um, Zena Cumpston, um, C-U-M-P-S-T-O-N, I don't know if anyone's heard of her, Bakanji artist, um, has just published a book with a few other authors called um, Plants, Past, Present and Future. Um, and uh, she, uh, she says that, you know, bringing, bringing the idea of country into the city um, so on page 53 of our report, um, my colleague Kelly um, included this quote, which I'll just read briefly because I think it speaks to this really nicely. Um, so Zena says, growing Indigenous grain crops on rooftops would be a step towards smaller scale farming practices, which we know are better for country and ultimately better for people. Our agricultural industry also needs transformative change if we are to meet the challenges imminent and thinking of how these green roofs could work across multiple imperatives would be an excellent strategy. We as Aboriginal people always try to work within holistic frameworks and interconnectedness is the essence of our ways of knowing and doing. What if a major part of the Green Roof Revolution about to occur in Melbourne involved the employment of predominantly Aboriginal rangers to design, research, speak for and manage these new landscapes? It may perhaps seem strange to conceive of these green spaces as landscapes, as country, but they certainly have the potential to be just this in their capacity to be embedded in culture, to provide and to be nurturing. We as Aboriginal people have always changed and adapted to survive and thrive. I see no reason why these places in the sky can't function in much the same way and be conceived in, uh, as country on the ground. Thank you, Nick. Um, Amazing. And I think that's a beautiful place to, to end today. Nick, um, Gavin, did you want to just jump in and say something there? Did I cut you off? Oh, that's, that was an amazing quote that um, Nick just read out. Um, wow, it really, that really resonated with me. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that whole recognition of um, Indigenous knowledge around plants, um, uh, we need to really ramp that up as well and, and, um, and make those connections with, with our amazing Indigenous culture. Well, I would like to encourage everyone to continue engaging with this urban agriculture conversation in all of its dimensions and to participate in as many of the different urban agriculture sessions that are available. Check out that Urban Agriculture Month link that Nick um, shared with you. And when I send out the recording this, I'll also put that in again. If there's something that's going on in your place, add it on there as well. I'll make sure that you've got the link that you can add on your, your event as well to really have these conversations ever as, even if it's like a, uh, you know, a neighbourhood um, kitchen uh, table discussion about what you can do in your, in your street to, you know, hosting event where you are. Uh, so 
Thank you so much um, to the three of you for being here today and, and launching um, the Permaculture Education Institute's participation in, uh, in Urban Agriculture Month. Like I said at the start, we've got a lot coming on. We've got five podcasts coming up, a film club and another masterclass to, to tail the end of this month. Um, and so we're collaborating with Sustain and Urban Ag Agriculture Month um, to bring all these to you. So thank you so much, Nick, for um, instigating this. Thank you, Gavin, for being zooming in from Italy uh, on your Churchill Fellowship and taking the time to do that. And thank you so much to Fiona for sharing with us all those brilliant examples. I mean, what a rich conversation that has been tonight. And I know it's just the beginning. I feel like, like you're saying, Nick, there's like there's something really tangible that's happening, not just here in Australia, but around the world. And it's there's movement in this. Uh, and it feels like there's so much more education, so much more action and so much more participation um, is going on and needs to keep going on. So everyone who's here and part of this session is part of this movement. So thank you all for being here as well. Um, it's been wonderful to have your company. Um, take care for the rest of your day, evening, morning, wherever you are calling in from. Um, and uh, we'll see you all again soon. <laughs>